Check engine light on? Take the guesswork out of your check engine light with O'Reilly Veriscan. It's free and provides a report with solutions based on over 650 million vehicle scans verified by ASE certified master technicians. And if you need help, we can recommend a shop for you. Ask for O'Reilly Veriscan today. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. This podcast is brought to you by Patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Head there to check out exclusive podcasts like Talking Futurama, Talk King of the Hill, the What a Cartoon Movie podcast, and tons more. Cartoons from present in the past. Every week will be an animated bash. What a cartoon. What a cartoon. Short but mostly shops. We'll talk while we'll analyze exploring as we go. What a cartoon! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Hello, everybody, and welcome to What a Cartoon, where radioactive spider blood is thicker than radioactive spider water. I'm one of your hosts, the mutant cook-off judge, Bob Mackey, and this is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever. Who is here with me today, as always? Hey, it's Henry Gilbert, and yep, claws are definitely more fun than doors. And this episode is all about the Spider-Man episode, Neogenic Nightmare Chapter 5, Mutant's Revenge. Subtlety's not your strong point, is it? Hey, can't even spell the word. Yes, and this episode aired on October 7th, 1995, and we are once again returning to the world of Spider-Man. I think we took a brief break because we had done too many Spider-Man podcasts, but (laughs) when Henry is a host on this podcast, we're going to eventually come back to Spider-Man, I think. Yes, I did. I held off of old Spidey for uh, a couple years now, but also, you know, this is in the middle of our move right now, and so we're trying to do some easier stuff, which this is on the easier end of, of our content because we've covered it many times before uh, and i know it very well and the last time we covered this series was nearly five years ago august of 2018 we covered the episode the menace of mysterio i believe gary butterfield was on that episode that's right wow that's another of the covid time compression where it feels like oh this was like three years ago right like no five like, five that couldn't have been half a decade <laughs> jesus christ but yeah i love spider-man this will be the next one to air before my birthday so i feel like it's a little birthday a treat for me to talk about my old buddy Spider-Man, as Michael Keaton said in Homecoming. Oh, is that what he does? It's the best scene in Homecoming when... How do I not remember this? It's when Michael Keaton's driving oh, okay. uh, them to the, the prom or the Homecoming dance. Okay, but they all have terrible names, so I forgot that was the first one and I have seen that. <laughs> yeah, it's when he's in the car and he realizes Peter Parker is Spider-Man and he's like letting him know he knows. He's like, oh, I bet you've been in trouble if it wasn't for your old buddy Spider-Man. And he just looks at him like terrifying like it's, you know he's good in that not so good in the current movie <laughs> <laughs> no there's a couple times in the flash where he seems like he's actually trying to act and do good but that movie is one of the most unsuccessful superhero movies of all time and all because they thought this ezra miller person is so good in this movie that we just have to do it we have to do it we got to release it. No, this is a much more fun topic of the the Marvel Universe and Spider-Man and my favorite superhero who I think of too often probably, but <laughs> I love the guy and I I have my Spider-Man statue at the little bust over there based on the 94 Spider-Man series and I wanted to pick this one too uh, for a couple reasons. One, I vividly remember watching this two-parter when it was live, uh, new, brand new. I was waiting, waiting, waiting for it. And it was also one of the first times where we talked talked about this on Batman where I was reading the comics and on a lot of times on Batman they'd reference a comic I didn't read when it was new and then they finally started doing stuff where I was like oh this is a new comic that I read and now it like when Bane showed up in Batman I was like oh I'd read that comic this was one of those moments because this is a 1995 cartoon adapting a 1994 comic book oh it was that recent yes yeah it was you know, very recent to refresh people's memories on this I didn't really watch this as a kid because the only superheroes I really knew about were super man and batman because of movies and when this came on i thought like who is this who is spider-man <laughs> and this show does not have the class of batman the animated series so i really didn't watch it i can appreciate it now though uh, i do think it's a good cartoon but as we covered in that last uh podcast five years ago the editing on this show is crazy 
it I wrote down Space Ghost Coast to Coast multiple times because I was like, oh, wait, they needed a line here. So they just <laughs> slowed down a character nodding their head and then yeah. they have Spidey on on the other screen saying, or off screen saying, I didn't know that that's what it was. We have to do this now or whatever. I mean, we did talk about it. It was five years ago, but I feel like this show has about two to three minutes less time than Batman did. And because of that, things move so fast that I feel like I'm lost sometimes because I don't have the background information about these characters. It moves at super speed. Yes, I was thinking multiple times in this, oh, what does someone like Bob feel about this? I, of course, know as a crazy super fan, Wolverine's using his enhanced senses to track them through the, uh, to track beasts throughout this building. Oh, that's news to me. That's why Spider-Man says, you're the one with the nose, and he keeps sniffing stuff. Like, it's, Mm. if you're a hardcore Marvel fan, you know that Wolverine has super senses and can track people. I know the healing, I know the claws, I didn't know about the super senses. That's why Spider-Man keeps saying, like, you're the boss, like, you lead me to where he is. That's because he can smell He's like a big dog. Uh, yeah, pretty much. A Wolverine's kind of like a dog, right? It's also why Wolverine, back in the day, used to smoke cigars all the time because it deadened the super smell because otherwise he's smelling everything all the time and it kind of drives him crazy. But now he's woke. Now he's woke. He can't smoke. He barely even kills people anymore, Wolverine does. It's a downside. There was a, <laughs> a noticeable lack of claw usage in this cartoon, and I understand why, but it's funny because when you watch this, you think, what is Wolverine's ability throwing? people it's, he throws people yes. so many times i'm gonna throw you up here now <laughs> he does a jump into the air claws out and then kicks guys <laughs> when he lands back down and, and that's surprisingly violent for this the problem with wolverine is and this was the same with like the punisher who will appear in the spider-man show two episodes after this one they are incredibly popular with kids but they are like stone cold murderers and so how do you ride around that like kids love seeing wolverine's claws because you know he's gonna stab people and in comic books you can get away with that but in a cartoon show you really can not on regular television and in case listeners don't remember it was also five years ago we covered the x-men animated series with matt mcmuscles the episode out of the past part one that's in the what a cartoon feed and in the patreon feed if you go way way back yeah it was a whole lot of fun covering those ones back to back and now we're covering the crossover episode which when this was happening i couldn't have been more excited because because these, not counting Batman, these were my two favorite cartoons on Saturday morning at the time. I feel like even the show is excited because whenever an X-Man is on the screen, you hear, <laughs> yes, yeah. well, keep in mind too that Hive the Band gets paid every time it plays. So I think that's why they hit it so much. Though it is a great song. It is good. I like it. It's better yeah. than this cartoon's theme song. Oh, you're insulting the work of Joe Perry of Aerosmith. I'm a hater. It'd be better without lyrics, I think. That's the worst part of it, yes. <laughs> The problem Spider-Man always has is that he has the unforgettable 60s theme. 25 years later, they're trying to write this theme and not have it be that theme, but they don't know what to do. I used to like that theme and now I hate it because every one of those movies has to cleverly reference it and I'm sick of it. We have to wait for the last boomer to die. <laughs> you know, now that I'm trying to think about it, I think Spider-Verse didn't do it. Thank God. I think Lord and Miller are better than that. Well, because they're also like closer to our age, so they don't have as much affinity for it. The best use of it lately has been I, I hate that every live action movie had to have a reference to it and it's a funny joke like, oh, it's Spider-Man's ringtone or whatever, but I like in the mcu ones that the composer of the spider-man theme just goes like let's just put in the thematic element of it for his theme like da 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 and then you do something else with it Mm -hmm. uh, from there yeah well also i should say this is our first uh spider-man podcast we're doing after across the spider-verse is released and was another great spider movie yeah i have not seen it yet but we are in late june i'm going to see it very soon and i'm excited for it even though i know it's very long and part one yes and people will work to death on it they should have promoted it as a part one and yeah that vulture story with four comments from it was a bummer to learn about and yeah i guess you're gonna see it in the home of all that suffering vancouver <laughs> where they did all the animation the theater it. will just be full of moaning people <laughs> oh 
<laughs> There's apparently a thing they did intentionally that Spider Verse has the ever so slightly different versions in different theaters. Where like basically it's a few times in the movie a different line is said by somebody, okay. and some people thought, oh, that's really intentional, like fun thing they do, and others are like, no, this came in so hot and at the last second they were just like, nah, let's have like three different versions of that. I don't care oh, which line it like is. Like cats, they patch the movie. It. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's some parts where I'm like, that definitely feels a little patched. This is not a spoiler. They have a real credits that is like the end of the first Spider-Verse, uh, which has, you know, really cool animation for the credit sequence. This has that, but then they didn't time it out correctly, so they can't credit everybody over the song. So when that song's over, they don't even have like a black scroll of names. It's just like these weird faded gradient backgrounds and then just white names on text it, it seriously looked like oh this is the temp version of the credits we'll like replace it later the kickstarter backers <laughs> yes yeah spider-verse takes a lot of people to make that movie so well I now i feel like it's more important than ever to see movies opening weekend you can get ahead of the tell-alls about the exploitation oh yes yeah you you can just enjoy it before you know all the suffering on every movie yeah though i regret seeing flash on the opening weekend but it was the new movie out that week when I, I mean, missed it. In. You just really have to go back and read the timeline of Ezra Miller's crimes. Yeah, I think I didn't want to think about <laughs> them as much. Man. Think about how he held a family hostage while he's <laughs> the Flash. <laughs> the, the they they held. The oh, family I apologize. Hostage, yes. yes. Yeah. Now it's uh, well. You when you said he you were talking about Barry Allen, his character. Yes, the, uh, he the... was rehearsing as the Flash while holding a mother and child hostage. <laughs> I'm the evil Flash now. When I was strangling this person, I'm the evil Flash in this thing. I'm as evil universe counterpart they were rehearsing a play <laughs> it's such an easy cover but yeah so x-men crossover spider-man i was super looking forward to it and yeah i knew then it wasn't as good as batman but i think the edge they had what's amazing about batman is most episodes are a singular story you can watch in any order and they're meant to be like these iconic timeless kind of stories there is linear stuff to it like when we did the trial episode it's better if you've seen the origin episodes that preceded it yeah but meanwhile x-men and spider-man afterwards x-men was two years and then spider-man comes in and see uh two years into that both of them have previously ons both are more like their comic book counterparts of this is the next issue in the story of the life of spider-man and this is done in sequence and it calls back to the previous issue so that's why uh they after the first season of spider-man now we're in the second season they call them chapters and a whole season has a title to it like this is the new neogenic nightmare season and the whole season is spider-man's radioactive blood is betraying him and he can't control his powers and in the next episode is when he's going to turn into a man a spider who has six arms and is mm. a monster and this is when we also next episode's morbin time yes as well actually yeah. i think my wife nina she's a big spider-man fan she likes venom too we watched the morbius one a couple years ago as a joke or whenever morbius <laughs> was out was that last year yes yeah yeah that movie got promoted for like four years straight it's, so it's hard to remember yeah, when it came out it's hard it's sort of like the flash <laughs> yes the very similar also who has committed more crimes jared leto or ezra miller oh mm. i guess all of jared leto's crimes have not been uncovered yet mm, he's that's why he's the joker he's the better joker mm -hmm. that, <laughs> but no this this is a really fun season of the show for the series and they also they're taking stuff from comics because the showrunner of the show john semper he in many interviews is like well yeah there's just a ton of great comics and i integrate them into the show though this episode also shows talent of reworking a comic and making it better for a cartoon because the comic this is based on this is better than the comic when i was rereading the comic i was like oh i was thinking of the better plot devices that happen in the cartoon that aren't in this comic hmm, okay the comic itself that's based on and this is where it all begins is Spider-Man The Mutant Agenda, which came out in early to mid-1994. It was a three-issue miniseries. The comic came out a year before this episode aired, a year and a half, so easily enough time for it to finish and then them to adapt it. Ooh, it's and, like an anime. They're adapting the manga. <laughs> and there's some filler in here to make it work, too. But actually, The Mutant Agenda is an even crazier thing because there's been a lot of talk about what does Stan Lee create? What does Stan Lee do? But Stan Lee was actually very involved 
in this compared to a lot of stuff because there's the spider-man comic strip which i don't know how much you've engaged with the spider-man comic strip bob oh that was in newspapers i should say yes yes i do remember it just people making jokes about it because it could tell very little of a story in three panels (laughs) the story can only move forward in the middle panel exactly the last panel will be repeated the next day as the first panel in a way right (laughs) yes panel one what happened yesterday panel two some new thing panel three cliffhanger for tomorrow and rinse and repeat especially when you read it in collected editions it really becomes obvious like how shitty it is to read honestly but when i was a kid it was never in my newspaper it is plotted exactly like a mary worth comic but it stars spider-man and stanley is technically the writer of it i would bet he actually wrote like the Hmm. script on it or whatever yeah i think the only licensed comic we had which by that i mean a comic based on a property the one we had in our paper was uh, mickey mouse but it would say mickey mouse by walt disney and as a kid i was like well i know he's dead (laughs) what's going on here this says copyright 1989 what's happening that's incredible i didn't know i I never got that i think the mickey mouse comics still say by walt disney or whatever Uh, wow how can that still be legal now like that's i guess when you make the deal you accept that in my comic strip page i don't think we had any licensed comics until the horrendous mr potato head comic oh Uh, i thought you're gonna say rugrats comic there was a mr potato head comic by jim davis oh really okay it was this post toy story it was it was post toy story and i think it ran for under six months and they got enough letters writing in like this sucks that they replaced it with pearls before swine which is a much better comic strip but yeah so the spider-man newspaper comic it also shows Stanley's age because we talked about it in Superman, but with the Fleischer Superman, when Superman hit it big, their real plan was like, it's not a big deal until it's a newspaper comic strip. This mm. printed comic is just to get us into the newspapers. Stan Lee's of that generation. So I could see why he's like, yeah, I'm going to be in charge of this comic strip. This is my job. Yeah. I can't remember in the Fleischer cartoons that we covered for Superman. Didn't say based on the newspaper comic or it something. It does. Okay, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and it mentioned action comics too. It definitely said newspaper comic. That was what they led with. And so Stan gets Spider-Man his own comic strip, I believe in the late seventies. He is the writer on it with working with a series of very good journeyman artists, including the just recently passed away John Romita Sr., who is one of my favorite Spidey artists. And then at this time, though, in the early 90s, he's looking to juice it up for the younger generation who is not reading the Spider-Man comic. How do you do that? Who are the hottest characters in comics? It's the X-Men. Every mutant character is so hot right now. And Stan Lee, who is currently doing the comic strip with his brother, Larry Lieber, he's the (laughs) artist. They decide they're going to have a crossover story where Spider-Man, over a several week period, will team up with a mutant. And, you know, Wolverine is the hottest one. And you might think after you watch this cartoon, oh, then it was Wolverine the whole time. No, in the comic strip... It's only Beast. It is only Hank McCoy's Beast he teams up with. There's no Wolverine in it. And I think it's because Stan Lee co-created the Beast that mm. he he wanted his character in there and not Wolverine. So they just jam him in a laser cage in this episode. <laughs> that he is uh he definitely gets sidelined a lot faster than he does in the original story. Yeah. I think it's on the Stan Lee commentary on The Simpsons where Matt Selman needles him of like, oh, you didn't even create Wolverine. He's like, Yeah, I know. I did like he maybe he's joking around, but I think he actually is annoyed he didn't create Wolverine or can take credit for it. He's a lot of fun on that commentary, I will say. The character of Stan Lee is such a fun guy. And at this point, he was he was in his 70s, right, at this point? Yes, yeah. This was, uh, yeah, 20 years before he died, and he was, like, in his mid-90s when he died. So, yeah, he's early, early 70s, late 60s, I think. They also plan it to be a big event that not only is it in the comic strip, but there will also be a three-issue miniseries at the same time that tells the same story. It's not technically a crossover it's more of a concurrent story that comic is by Stephen grant and scott collins Stephen grant is an underappreciated comic writer a big reason anybody gives a shit about the punisher is because Stephen grant who he is very left wing for his time he wrote a great punisher comic like punisher was nobody until Stephen grant's and you could say mike zek is the artist really made everybody care but Stephen grant's storytelling on punisher was the big deal like that's why people love punisher and so Stephen grant lifer in comics great writer in marvel he gets this job it is 
honestly kind of a crappy comic it ends when it needs five more pages to tell a story so in this episode when the monster is created that's the second to last page of the comic and spider-man just like punches him once and he's like well i'll see you later beast and he just swings away it's like you ran out of pages here guys it does feel like three books is not enough for this story no it really really was not enough but It was a big deal to Stan Lee. Like, this was a story Stan Lee actually kind of sort of wrote that was a recent comic. So you can bet that Stan Lee, who's an executive producer on the Spider-Man series and friends with John Semper, the showrunner, that he's going to want to prioritize this crossover. But so behind the scenes, what John Semper was saying back in working on season two in 1994, he was told that, Fox liked their ratings, but it wasn't as good as the X-Men. Hmm. So what if you guys crossed over with the X-Men? That might boost up your ratings. We'll get kids to watch it because the X-Men are on this. And when John Semper then takes this comic, Stephen Grant actually gets credited based on a comic by Stephen Grant, which there's a lot of issues they took from that there's no credit of based on a comic. So good on Stephen Grant actually getting like a TV credit on that. Now, how did Saban have to deal with this? So this is all internal at Saban. like cause Oh, the, the Spider-Man cartoon is a Saban thing too? Sort of. Okay. He's involved. It is more Marvel, but he's part of it. But so Semper wanted to do it. He also sees like, no, Wolverine should be the guy who hangs out the most with Spider-Man because he's the most popular but he did say i do have to negotiate this a little with Haim saban to get his approval for the mutants to appear in anything and he said fortunately my other executive producer avi arad is great friends with Haim saban <laughs> and so they easily agreed to it so there was actually very little problem with that avi and Haim are both israeli businessmen so i think they have a lot of history together and a long time friendship Though I also do think that Stanley probably was, it, the, this isn't mentioned, but I was thinking Sa- Stanley was pressuring Semper into doing it too. And Semper also admits that he didn't really know the X-Men too well compared to Spider-Man. So that's why there's four credited writers on this along with him. Michael Edens, Francis Moss, and Ted Peterson, who are all writers on X-Men who came on to help him make sure all the X-Men sounded like themselves. Okay. Yeah. So then the director on this is Bob Richardson, who is the, he's the series director of the whole series, but good luck finding out who boarded or laid out any of this or who is the episode (laughs) director because it's a bulk credits operation. The animation is by Mario (laughs) Paints. So this is another level of it I've learned since then. We've covered a lot more TMS shows and this is technically tms uh but this is them doing early digital and it's very cheap looking there's the uh our modern tv screens do this no favors even at the time on a crt you can see that this was obviously early digital but boy you see every flaw now every chop every slowed down frame like the terrible frame rate it just looks so bad and it's clearly edited on video and there's no remastering it like i i mean you think disney would be interested in if they could get the masters but i also would think it's very popular possible tms did not keep these digital masters around for this thing either. yeah and i think it was rendered at a very low resolution too you can see it looks like a low res computer game if you get close enough to the screen oh yeah and i, I learned too the people who did all the 3d in this which there's some very fun 3d oh in this. there are the lawnmower man shows up a few times <laughs> the team is chronos digital entertainment who were primarily game devs this was their only tv credit they did fear effect that's their their big claim to fame the two fear effect video games okay I I didn't play those. I just knew them as back in the day when there nothing had gay characters in anything that it would be on every list of like gay video game characters just because they had some sapphic romantic elements mainly for straight men to jerk off to. Oh, absolutely. This is not quite as bad as when we covered Mortal Kombat The Journey Begins where it looks like a point and click adventure game. (laughs) It doesn't have that going on for it. I think that's because the TMS people could finesse it slightly better and be like, no this looks like shit we have to slow this down as much as possible put spider-man right in the center of the frame so maybe you look at him instead of these buildings <laughs> and they're not getting batman money from uh, saban and company i think they pay for 18 minutes of footage every episode and then recycle the extra three minutes out of whatever they can and on top of that their budget for one episode has to be a fraction of what tms got budgeted for any of their season one batmans you yeah know? i think the 18 minute length is just a product of it being a cheap show and we've heard multiple times 
from Bruce Tim saying that he suspects TMS was occasionally outsourcing things without telling him. Mm -hmm. This already is the outsourced, like, this is the outsourced team that got sent the stuff that Bruce Tim is thinking is being outsourced. And I have a feeling there's a lot of times on this show where they outsource that on this team. I think so. Though the supervising director on the Japan side that's listed in the credits is Keiko Oyamada, and they are credited on a lot of classic Tiny Toons and also Cyber 6. Their earliest credit appears to be Lupin the Third Part 2. Oh, wow. So they've been at TMS for a long time, and they have a credit on the 2022 Shenmue show they did. I so, forgot, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. I mean, the issue is well, they're not given enough money, and the characters on screen have to be as complex as they look in the comics, and those two things do not mix well at all. It's why Spider-Man can barely move. It's why you see the same whip from his web shooter like three times in this episode. There are so many times in this where like, wait, Spider-Man's nodding his head in a completely different room than he was in the last shot. <laughs> last thing about TMS, update on this, and I am so ashamed I didn't do this when, I know this when we did our World's Finest podcast earlier this year. Half of that is not TMS, it's Ghibli. Ghibli actually animated half of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, my jaw hit the floor, but it makes total sense. It's such a beautiful two-parter uh, that just came out recently, right? Well, that, that's like kind of new information though, right? It is. So yes, I learned this recently. Uh, from the very good animation YouTube channel Stevem S-T-E-V-E M, like Steve M. They did, not only did they pull up some stuff that I confirmed for myself in the Princess Mononoke art book that's in there, but he actually interviewed an animator who worked on it. It was a, a Frenchman who was working at Ghibli at the time. So he was he was able to find him and interview him. But so thanks to the insane work schedule of Princess Mononoke, which someday when we do that as a what a cartoon movie, I feel like it'll just be an hour about what a chaotic mess it was. But they needed TMS to do stuff for them, including there's some digital coloring in that movie that was the earliest. It was the apparently the first HD digital coloring maybe anybody had ever done an animation hmm. but so for TMS to do it they kind of did a instead of a money thing they just did an exchange they're like okay we'll help you get out Mononoke on time in 1997 but we owe a bunch of Superman episodes as including this crossover you animate half the crossover and so at a time when they could spare no animators Ghibli's like fuck all right we'll animate half of this thing so I believe the second Half of the second episode and all of the third episode that comprises the movie, that's Ghibli doing it. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, they have done a lot of stuff on the side, though, because the, the movies they make come around every three or four years, and they're very expensive, and some of them don't make money. They sometimes secretly animate things. Around the same time, they also did more than one episode of Evangelion, uh, the, the one that everybody knows is the Blackout episode uh, with the, you know, the spider with the drippy eye, that one. Okay. That's Is that the one with Jet alone? Uh, because that's a weird looking episode that I, I like. I think they also did do Jet alone okay. too. Yeah, yeah. But I know they did the the blackout one because people point out like, look at that face Misato makes. That's a <laughs> Ghibli face. But technically, that was a Ghibli one. And they also did the Batman. Now that I know it's a Ghibli episode, I think we'll do it at some point. They also did the Batman episode where the young girl who is a cast off of Clayface, like basically Clayface's daughter from the 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 WB years. They also did that one. Oh wow, wow. Which has some very Ghibli level goo animation in it. We didn't deserve to see that on television. I swear. <laughs> it's too good. Yeah. And I think it's also why they did such a good job animating a wayfish young woman because that that is Ghibli is very good at that. So also speaking of money, John Semper, whenever he's interviewed about this, one of the big things he's talking about how they wanted this episode. Everybody internally was happy about it, but he never heard the end of how expensive it was. Like mm. they complained about the price so much and I couldn't believe what the problem was that made it so expensive. It wasn't the footage it wasn't licensing it was the cast there are a lot of actors and a lot of i would put in quotes famous people in this they got the real people which they were actually committed to we want to get the real people and this is insane to say that this was the thing because we are so used to it's our jobs our remote podcasting remote recording is everybody can do it all the time now in 1994 
they could not reliably record with the Toronto based X Men cast and get it for their normally recorded in LA shows. So instead, they fly the entire X Men cast to Los Angeles. And Haim Sabayan, I think, especially was like, This is so expensive to fly all these people here. I hate it. And meanwhile, 40 million kids are watching this. I know, like how much he's got the he's got the airplane receipts in front of him. He's fuming in 1994 dollars. Like, okay, they had to fly seven actors from Toronto to Los Angeles, and I'm I'm sure they're not flying first class. What five hundred a ticket, three thousand dollars? Like, and what's hotels back then? Like, that's a, another thousand dollars. I bet they're split in rooms. I, I bet you they are. It's like an anime convention; they're all in one room. <laughs> but yeah, apparently that was Semper. Never heard the end of how much it was that that they would never, the X Men, never come back on the show because they don't want to fly him out from Toronto. I remember there was a recent, maybe within the last ten years, there was a crossover of like all the Ninja Turtles, but they couldn't get the original actors because they're SAG. Right. Right. Yeah, it was the same deal. Like, and that that was another Saban production too. Oh, that's Saban. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was the 2003 series. I'm thinking of. Yeah. So that was a long time ago. And I'm glad those guys stood by their thing. Like, you know, we like being the turtles, but we're not gonna cross the line on this and give you our talents for free. And Haim Saban is not gonna pay SAG levels. So, but same deal. Like. The reason they recorded the X-Men in Toronto in the first place, and I love all of our Canadian X-Men voices in this, but the reason they recorded there is to save money. Like, they were lucky. I believe Spider-Man is not a Canadian recording because they had just built a new office in Los Angeles for Marvel Entertainment Group that they operated out of that so they could hire L.A. actors. Hmm. Uh, but that's that's why Jim Cummings is actually on this show. Oh, that let us so you know it's in the Los Angeles production because Jim Cummings voices the Shocker. Oh, okay. I, he's I, I've not seen one with the Shocker in it. I don't think you must have seen the clip though of oh uh, which which clip of Spider Man in his black costume screaming at the Shocker. I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. I don't think I have. Well, now I got to pull it up we here. Pull it up quick. now. I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! That's wow, I can hear his uh, throat dying. Poor Christopher Shocker! Daniel Bond. Yeah. I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! Just hearing the name Shocker, between me and my husband, if ever the Shocker comes up for some reason, uh, then we have to say at least a couple of the lines from that. <laughs> chase you to the ends of the earth! And that Shocker, you didn't hear him there. He's Jim Cummings, uh, voices uh, the Shocker there. Yeah, the X-Men come down for it. It was very expensive. Storm did return in the final season for a big Secret Wars crossover episode, but that's because the actress Allison Seeley Smith had moved down to Los Angeles at that point. Hmm. And then it's funny because now they're making a new season of the X-Men show, X-Men 97, with the majority of the cast returning, though a couple characters like Jubilee have been recast with racially appropriate actors. So no more Claire Redfield playing uh, Jubilee. That is correct. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't, even <laughs> I know. didn't know that either. You, when you said that, I was like, oh shit, you're right. I, I think uh, Nina had to tell me that Jubilee is Asian because her name is Jubilation Lee. Jubilation Lee is yeah. her name, yes, yeah. And it's uh people have joked like that is oh, what do you do? Like Asians love fireworks, right? Like so oh, her powers are fire. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> though though her co-creator is, I believe Jim Lee is a co-creator on it, though. It's uh, it's a Claremont Lee thing. At least there's an Asian American co-creator on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But yes, no, Ju- Jubilee is that's hardly as bad as Psylocke, who Psylocke is technically a British woman who then ninja just kidnapped her and turned her into a Japanese woman. Jesus. So, yeah. Well, I mean, Jubilee doesn't fire like sweet and sour sauce out of her arms, so <laughs> it could be worse. <laughs> but yeah, there's a new series that maybe by the time you hear this, San Diego Comic Con will have happened and they'll give an announcement for it. But it's been weirdly delayed. Like the new series that resumes the storytelling on Disney Plus called X Men 97, I think it has the feel of a show that's been done for like six months and hmm. disney doesn't know when they want to release it it's very confusing but i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to it 
Last preamble thing I want to say is that I love The Beast. The Beast is my favorite X-Men. And I think it's because of shows like this where him and Spider-Man teamed up a lot in the early 90s when I was a kid reading comics. And so I think that was my immediate interest in The Beast. And also when you're 12 or 13, you think he's very smart when he quotes the most obvious Shakespeare things you (laughs) see on coffee mugs. (laughs) What a genius guy. The lady doth protest too much. Well, and also he's he's a big guy. And I'm like, oh, I'm a big guy. Guy and I also his name is Henry. It's my name. Is, is that when you decided to drop Max? <laughs> no, that didn't happen until uh, I became a professional games mm. journalist. Uh, no, while well, also with Beast too. I'm looking at my Beast toy over there. I'm looking at uh, there's like four beast things behind you that i'm looking at yes yeah <laughs> the beast uh the beast is also a favorite of me and uh my husband darren i should also this could be an entire rant i hate what they're doing with the beast currently in the comics and i hope they change it very soon this is the beast i love who is a friendly guy who also works very well as a gay metaphor this is the thing that's hurt beast lately they can actually have real gay and queer characters in marvel comics now but when i was a kid beast got to be your metaphorical gay character Mm. like especially in this episode talking about his self-hatred and how he wanted to cure himself and all this but now the characters can actually be gay he's just a straight guy who hates himself and it doesn't doesn't work the same i wish they would just have him be not straight anymore like just say like oh yeah i dated guys or whatever yeah we're in the 2020s my question for you is it's so interesting because we grew up in the 90s and the x-men were gigantic like i knew they were a big deal but uh on from my perspective I was like, Spider-Man, who is this guy? Who cares? What a weird <laughs> character. But now it's it's flip-flopped where I feel like there are so many Spider-Man movies. He is the biggest character next uh, below Batman, I would say. And where are the X-Men movies? Like where what's happening there? What's what's the gridlock there? Oh, it's a very complicated business thing that is no fun. Uh, so yeah, the X-Men were the biggest deal in the 90s. Spider-Man wasn't unpopular, but X-Men were above him. And thanks to the Spider-Man movie coming out, out spider-man surpassed them again and he became the biggest guy in the early aughts and then in the late aughts that's when iron man appears and so he kind of overtakes spidey because spidey movies were getting crappy but now spider-man's back at number one at least for marvel characters short version the x-men were the crown jewel of marvel in the 90s marvel is going into bankruptcy they need to license it to get influx of money right now they license it to fox with an unfavorable deal that fox basically has the rights to make x-men movies forever and Marvel doesn't get as big a chunk of the money, but they needed money right then. By the time they're out of bankruptcy, they're like, fuck, the X-Men are making a ton of money, but not for us, for Fox. So they intentionally scale back the X-Men, do less with them, make less X-Men stuff to the point where the X-Men kind of are nothing. And then compared to how they were in the 90s, nothing. And then, of course, Disney gets to buy Fox. And now the X-Men are starting to come back because now Marvel gets to make all the money off X-Men movies and cartoons happy ending of sharing it. yes they win <laughs> thank god that disney, disney was able to buy yeah that's why when people were saying oh my god uh, disney should not be allowed to be this big they should not get to buy fox for 80 billion dollars and then everybody else says but now the hulk and wolverine can finally fight each other in a movie <laughs> yay <laughs> So that's why the X-Men kind of became nothing or they're lost to a generation, it feels like. And yeah, it really does. We'll see if they can make a comeback now, but they're uh, intentionally Marvel wanted you to like X-Men less because they didn't get the money off of it. So now let's flash back in time to when the X-Men were bigger than Spider-Man as we talk about part two of their crossover, Mutants Revenge. Tomorrow, after Batman and Robin, the Mighty Mutant matchup continues. The X-Men join forces with Spider-Man to take on a powerful villain. I'm impressed. I'm not here to impress you. Can this tag team prevail against impossible odds? I'm gonna find out for myself. Don't miss the excitement on Spider-Man tomorrow after Batman and Robin on Fox Kids. Something new is shaking from Chef Boy RD, and kids everywhere are getting into it. New Spider-Man pasta. Whoa! Let's show Mysterio the ropes, kid. Hello. Looks like he'll be hanging around for a while. Totally. 
newly webbed out Spider-Man shape smothered in secret sauce. New Spider-Man pasta from Chef Boyardee. So hot, it's practically radioactive. Thank goodness for Chef Boyardee. Hope you guys safely made it through the danger room to get to the break of this week's podcast. And this is Henry here. Hey, everybody. It's Bob Mackey, and I sound about 99% like the Joker. Thanks so much for listening this week as we return to the world of Spider-Man, as we also are preparing for our big moves across uh, states and countries. And we're only able to do awesome podcasts like this while we're preparing to move into our new homes. Thanks to supporters like you who subscribe at patreon.com slash talking Simpson. That's right. If you want to support the show and get all kinds of cool bonuses on top of that, head on over to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons and sign up for just five bucks a month. With that five bucks a month, you'll get every episode one week at a time and ad free and also access access to our vast, vast six-plus-year collection of full-length miniseries episodes covering things like The Critic and Mission Hill, Batman the Animated Series, Futurama, and King of the Hill, and you also get monthly new episodes of both Talking Futurama and Talking of the Hill. Again, that is over 150 bonus episodes that you haven't heard if you're not a patron of patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And there is a $10 level as well. When you sign up for that, you can access all of the $5 stuff naturally, but you can also access one mega long podcast once a month, only for patrons of that level or higher. And what is that, Henry? Bob's talking about the What a Cartoon Movie podcast, which you, if you're listening to this on the free feed, get to hear a preview of every month, where we cover an animated feature film very in depth. Right now, we are nearing the end of our summer of Pixar. We covered Toy Story 4, we covered The Incredibles, we did a commentary on A Bug's Life, and now you're going to hear the history and commentary on cars as we discuss the 2006 film that became one of the most successful but still currently dislike pixar movies of all time and we have a whole lot of fun talking about that if you sign up you can hear the full thing and you get access to the entire back catalog of every what a cartoon movie we've covered which is almost five years of them at this point i'd say over 200 hours just of what a cartoon movie in addition to all the other stuff this year as well we've covered things like dumbo and little shop of horrors we've covered everything from akira to a goofy movie spider-man into the spider-verse to beavis and butthead do the universe and the list is only growing so please check it all out for yourself when you visit patreon.com slash talking simpsons to see what you're missing and if you've never signed up for patreon before it is very easy to do and once you sign up you can use uh, any podcast app you might have to hear all of our bonus content alongside all of your normal podcasts as part of your podcasting lifestyle and there is a patreon app for any smart device you might have and you can hear our bonus content that way as well but no matter which way you do it is so easy to access everything waiting for you behind the paywall at patreon.com slash talking simpsons now my spidey sense is tingling to say it's time to return to our podcast about spider-man the animated series 1994 and mutants revenge Spider-Man. Doc Connor said I might be mutating into some sort of freak. There's one man who might help me. Ugh! I've got to find a cure. Enough! My work is not to cure mutants. It's always the same. When I need help, I'm on my own. Wait! A man named Herbert Landon has been studying your particular form of mutation. Most promising, don't you agree? Why are you going out of your way for me? I'm still human. I'm not sure I still am. How sad. He's stunned. We've got a real live mutant. Landon, what is the meaning of this? I intend to destroy all mutants. Spider-Man, what have you done with Beast? <laughs> A fight to the bitter end!
All right, and we are back with the classic theme song again. It's so it's so great. And you even got to hear the I found an original commercial that they did for this promoting this episode. So you can see what kids like me were like, oh boy, tomorrow on Spider-Man, right after Batman, they're going to meet X-Men. Yay! This is a Saturday morning cartoon, right? Yes. Once they got up to 50 episodes, that's when it became a weekday. It went in weekday rotation. But yeah, at this point, this is like the 19th episode total of the series, I think. So it's still just in the weekend rotation. Again, talk about the money. Mortar is like, we're doing 65 right now, and we're launching that with Batman Marvel. They don't got the budget to put up 65 at the start for for old spider-man and yeah you get to see a good previously on part one though there's a couple funny things in it i want to play over the part one one was we had this in the mysterio one too and i feel like this happens every time they need to fill time in the middle of the episode spider-man goes like well i guess i'll never be spider-man again <laughs> time to say goodbye to all my family and then as he's about to leave the house he looks at a picture of uncle ben and he's like uncle ben wouldn't want me to quit that's right i'm not gonna stop being Sp-. like he quits being spider-man for like 45 seconds every time yeah it's it's a less than a minute long crisis of conscience <laughs> spider-man is a very dramatic guy uh and it's what i love about him and also just to make the allegory of uh you know bigotry clear in this there is a scene where spider-man or peter parker meets a college friend of his who's just like i hope you don't like hanging out with those muties and then peter's like i'm surprised at you really surprised and he leaves the room she's like muty lover yeah i mean the allegory is obvious but i it is kind of shocking to hear mutant lover because it's obviously a takeoff on uh n-word lover right yeah and and muties is the n-word of the of the x-men world like it was heavily established in that there's a scene that out of context looks insane but i i say in context it kind of works you've maybe seen the panel out there of kitty pride of the x-men is being talked to by an african-american man who says you hung out with a bunch of muties lately and then kitty pride to make a point says i don't know have you hung out with a bunch of and she says the hard r n word back to him and the point was to make like this is equivalent to us but if you see the single panel and i still wouldn't write it now it it was a mistake you can't really compare that to a fake thing yes uh, this fake thing's the same as the the worst slur probably you can say in the english language i'd say but yeah no they make it very clear and i think that's good too again that you have a showrunner john semper who is like the i think back then the only african-american head writer on a kid's cartoon so it feels more it, it, it feels more earned in this not that you can't yeah. just be an ally on this stuff anyway if you're a white guy writing it but i'm not yeah. saying it'll be better or worse but i feel like there would be more uh, sensitivity readers attached to shows like these who would say that's kind of too close to the real thing and you might want to make it a little different i mean now i feel like you do need more i feel like you need more metaphorical distance on this stuff because the executives on the show will be like uh we'll get letters from the red states if you make it so clear this is about bigotry <laughs> yeah yeah you're right so, about that so i i feel like it'd be even more obfuscated but this is back when executives didn't care because this is a toy commercial <laughs> spider-man to is doing crt <laughs> I mean, can Spider-Man be as open about hating a bigot on this one? I, I don't today. I don't know, but yeah. So we get all the previously on. He visits the X-Men. We meet all the X-Men. He then leaves all of them, and only Beast follows him along. And then Beast instantly gets kidnapped like a chump. Then Wolverine chases after where Beast was. This is where he runs into Spider-Man, and in classic comic book form. A misunderstanding leads to two fi- uh, heroes trying to kill one another. <laughs> yeah, it's totally fan wish fulfillment because you're thinking, who would win in this fight? And they have mm-hmm. to contrive a situation in which a fight happens. I'm thinking this happens in manga even. Uh, like in One Piece, there is a section where basically there's a big misunderstanding and uh, Zoro and Luffy have to fight. And I know it's because people wanted to see that. For sure. That's- and it's, it's very contrived too, but it feels like this is a chapter that everyone wanted part of the fun of comics is playground arguments of like fictional character could this fictional character be this fictional character and because it's all made up anybody can beat anybody it's all fake you know but my personal reading on it is that if it was a fight to the death wolverine could kill spider-man eventually but 
if Spider-Man, Spider-Man literally could not be touched by Wolverine ever. If, if it was just like, hey, who could avoid the other longest? Spider-Man wins that fight. If it's yeah. who kill each other first, Wolverine wins Because that Wolverine fight. can just slice right through the webs. Yeah, he can't be webbed up, but Spidey can jump way higher than Wolverine, and he's stronger than Wolverine too. But I also like on the to be continued they freeze frame on the two of them like jumping like it's like a comic book cover right there though it's also funny too you're seeing hobgoblin watch the whole thing and so you're seeing it from like two colorful men punching each other in an alley and it looks from the hobgoblin's vantage point it looks very silly they did that run of comics in the late 90s where it was they did the epic fights between the heroes right it was like superman versus what captain america I think. yeah this uh who did spider-man fight is what i want to know he fought Superboy, which okay, is that's kind of lame. Great, yeah. Who won in that one? Well, fans voted, so it was a popularity oh. contest of Spider Man. Okay, I forgot yeah. you, you could vote on who would win in that one. Yeah, it, it took the, it let them wipe their, wash their hands of the whole thing, and it really rigged the votes. Yeah, no, that, that happened in the mid 90s because the, comic boom cratered so hard in 1996 that marvel and dc were like we got to work together and try to sell as many comics as possible it was basically just fan fiction that was done by votes right yes yeah though it also sucked because they had to be all of their current iterations that were in the comics so you had to see like oh man spider-man's meeting all the dc characters but he's like clone Spider-Man. Like it's in the middle of the clone arc, so it's uh, not even real Spider-Man. Is it the Superman in the black costume in that one? Or? It's Superman with his mullet. Okay, mullet yeah. yeah. And though Batman is Batman in it, it's not when he was replaced with Azrael as Azbat. But speaking of Batman stuff, so we got Hobgoblin here. It didn't really click for me. As an adult, the second you hear it, you know this is Mark Hamill doing basically the Joker. Yeah, they're not even, it's like, I'm the Joker and I'm Hobgoblin. (laughs) This is what a chump I am. Uh, I'm taking notes and I'm like, and then Green Goblin throws a pumpkin bomb. And I keep typing about Green Goblin and then he's off screen. So the caption says, Hobgoblin, colon, I'll get you, Spider-Man. It's like, oh, this is Hobgoblin. (laughs) Why? Why is there Hobgoblin and Green Goblin? And they do the same things. It's obscenely complicated. I'll I'll explain it I can. I'm sorry. So Green Goblin, he's created in the mid 60s. He becomes one of Spider-Man's top villains. But in the early 70s, they kill him off. This is before they decide to bring back this character. Eventually, he does get brought back in the 90s. In the 80s, they're like, we need a new goblin then. So they create the Hobgoblin. And he is supposed to be the opposite of Green Goblin because he's supposed to be a four-pay mercenary, not a crazy guy who Mm. uh, has a split personality. So you got the Hobgoblin. He's a really cool villain. The first year of Hobgoblin story, some of my favorite Spider-Man comics. Then what gets more complicated is when they're working on season one of Spider-Man, John Semper joins the show and he says, wait, you can't have Hobgoblin before Green Goblin because his character Hobgoblin steals the equipment of the Green Goblin and makes it his own. You can't have Hobgoblin first and then the Green Goblin hurts Green Goblin. Is there time travel involved? No, Aww. no. He's What he is told is... Well, we've already made the toy deal and Hobgoblin's in the first run of toys. So Hobgoblin comes first. (laughs) So you end up with the Green Goblin appears later in this season and he is inspired by the Hobgoblin. It's ridiculous. So that's why it is extremely even to me as a kid i was like wait hobgoblin first no it's green goblin first no the toy came first and on top of that they have to make the hobgoblin's identity it's the backstory of the second hobgoblin from the comics which doesn't even make sense if you don't have a first hobgoblin it john semper does his best but it makes no sense but you better believe i had the hobgoblin toy and (laughs) the double toy that's in this episode it's also so silly so he's got his purple goblin glider but then he's got a bigger goblin glider that his little goblin glider sits in and you fly around with that you better believe i had both those uh hobgoblin toys for sure i wish it actually flew i think it shoots out discs okay does that choking hazards so i tried to look up anytime mark hamill's talked about playing the hobgoblin he barely talks about it he's like oh i thought these were joker lines so i found one interview recently from four weeks ago where he said like oh yeah i was a hobgoblin you know it sounded like he regretted it because he said i was in danger of being typecast as always being the crazy villain and he said i challenged myself to pitch down my voice at least a little bit so it doesn't sound exactly like the joker but he definitely said he reconsidered taking similar villain roles again after this one it's maybe five percent different than the joker i think he doesn't giggle as much and he eventually goes like 
no, I just want money. I'm out of here. Like, instead, it just makes him, oh, what if Joker was more boring? Oh, well, that's yes. fun to listen to. <laughs> yeah, boring Joker. <laughs> so it is so confusing that the Green Goblin comes after the Hobgoblin, and you want the Green Goblin first, but he's going to throw a bomb at them while the two guys are fighting each other, and just because it's a cartoon, they just toss each other around in an alley. No punches connect, no claws stab. And then Spidey webs up his pumpkin bob to his hand, which I feel like cutting off a pumpkin pumpkin bomb with a razor it seems like a mistake yeah yeah it's uh <laughs> that looked dangerous to me in our first clip here we get to hear spider-man and wolverine threatening one another i'm tired of being diplomatic what have you done with beast <sighs> i don't know what you're talking about <sighs> aren't you at all interested in that clown who just threw a bomb at us <clears throat> i don't have time for games wolverine good because I ain't playing any. You boys are having so much fun. I hate to bust up the party, but I will anyway. <laughs> we'll finish our conversation after I take care of Laughing Boy. No! <laughs> hey, he did laugh, and he was called Laughing Boy. Well, Wolverine calls him a clown later, too, <laughs> which... <laughs> but We're trying to distance uh, him from that idea, please. <laughs> Kids just watched an episode of Batman before this, guys. The Joker might have been on it. <laughs> yeah, the exchange, too. I mean, there's so many times where I'm just like, Spider-Man can literally say anything because there's no need for lip sync. Like, you oh, can add anything you he, want to like say. He's like Garfield. <laughs> he, that was the mistake in that Garfield movie we yeah. did for We Hate Movies. Listen to it, folks. Though when Spider-Man Spidey Sense hits... I still love how the coloring on him changes. It's faded different, and there's a weird background on him. Then, meanwhile, during the fight, Hobgoblin distracts them and flies away and smashes a camera that gets the attention of Landon, the boss at the Brand Corporation. I was happy to hear David Warner doing his David Warner voice. And He's please, the greatest. Yeah, please go back to our What a Cartoon about Freakazoid. The second episode we covered, Dexter's Date, you hear him do a, I don't know, seven minute long Hello Dolly parody. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, this is us hearing him as a more straightforward villain compared to that. Yeah, I mean, Paul Rugg on Twitter has nothing but nice things to say about hanging out with David Warner. And it's so sad. He, he passed away just a year ago yeah, when we're recording. I was thinking we recently lost him and he was all over 90s animation. His voice is un mistakable it's great it must have happened after he hit it big with time bandits in the early 90s he must have been like i'm moving to los angeles and i'm doing the america thing and so he gets cast in the secret of the use he has that great episode of star trek the next generation where he's torturing picard and oh, yeah. then straight to the voice acting gigs he is one of those british actors of that generation where their view is acting is work and i like to work so i'll do everything it feels so refreshing compared to american actors who want to be important or do important things meanwhile you have incredibly well-trained shakespearean actors like david warner going like the ooze is over there oh leonardo the ooze isn't exactly <laughs> just or him he, and, he was the ooze monger in that movie <laughs> or him and gargoyles he's the magus and he's just like the grimora machinorum no <laughs> <laughs> he's great yeah i can't believe we lost him yeah he's yeah, yeah i bet he had so many fun stories i wish him and patrick stewart were still doing a new version of caesar today he could have been in picard or was he his deep fake will likely be in picard someday no okay. he well, should picard have been. is done they yeah can't make any more of it it's done for now i hope they'll never do better than that third season the other actors could appear in other things and still reprise their roles but i'm saying that patrick stewart is too old to play in a lead role anymore he is too old from what i hear about picard you don't need to watch any season but the third because the third season is like hey remember seasons one and two <laughs> well forget about that yeah. we made the series we should have made which is all fan service who are we kidding well and the other picard shows are like we just need picard right we can cheap out and then the third season we're like no we have to get everybody yeah. it's not real Oh, yeah. I wanted to point out that the last TV role David Warner had was playing the Lobe on that Teen Titans Go Freakazoid episode. That's great. Yeah. That's, I mean, I don't want him to have a final role. I want him to still be alive. But if your last one can be the Lobe, that's pretty great. <laughs> Then, uh, yes, Landon, he's so evil because he can shoot a missile in the middle of Manhattan just for like, what? Oh, we have a missile right on top of this building. Shoot it, shoot it into this alleyway. Also, yeah, the David Warner, his character in the previous episode literally just says like, yeah, genocide. I want to kill every mutant. Beast says, that's genocide. He's like, yep. 
Yep, I'm killing everybody. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> you said it, not me. So, uh, yes, this interrupts their fight. This is when Wolverine and Spider-Man realize they should be on the same side. Come on. We'll finish your tap dance somewhere else. Let me see where you got hit. Don't bother. I heal real quick. Mutant heal thyself? I'm impressed. I'm not here to impress you. Where's Beast? I told you I don't know. I haven't seen him since last night when he told me about this place. I I like uh, I just like the cute line. Mutant heal thyself. Spider-Man writers need to remember Spider-Man's funny. He He's quotes funny the Bible. <laughs> Back then you could quote the Bible and it wasn't a problem. <laughs> and yes, they needed to let you know he had a healing factor which this was what killed me as a gamer in the 90s. They could never put his healing factor in the game because it would ruin the balance of the video games I th- back then. I thought it was in that really bad NES X-Men game. It definitely wasn't in the Genesis game. Yeah. I remember that. Or in the arcade game. That Genesis game, folks, not very good. It looked really good. We, we covered all, a bunch of X-Men games on Retronauts with Gary Butterfield. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, then that power actually was great for like 2009 for a Wolverine game because every character in, in mature rated video games back then had a healing factor <laughs> thanks to gears of war that's really. true yeah. wolverine predicted all video games where you just crouch behind something and then your health bar fills up again well i mean those guys all grew up reading the wolverine comics maybe cliff blazinski was like oh if only our giant meat man in these games <laughs> could heal like wolverine does so yeah but this is for plot purposes they need to establish he can heal quickly because though they don't explain it too well the reason wolverine is like unconscious and then wakes back up to when they're dangling is because he's waiting to heal from his healing factor. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that at all, actually. <laughs> I also do like that Hobgoblin and Landon, they're both bad guys, but they hate each other. And like one is trying to fuck with the other, but they also hate the superheroes. So it's at least a nice, like, it's not a villain team up. It's actually the, the heroes are getting caught between two villains arguing with each other. This is when they start following his nose like Toucan Sam into the building to find where Beast is. <laughs> this is when Wolverine tries to explain some things to Spidey. Perfect. You two keep landed distracted so I can collect what's owed me. So, what's with that clown in the Halloween costume? He claims Landon has a secret agenda to destroy all mutants. I'm gonna find out for myself. And you're coming with me if you're lying. Your fillet spider pal. I get the picture, Wolfie. But have you ever thought of seeing a manicurist about those things? Where are they? They got away, sir. Then find them! They can't be allowed to disrupt my experiment! <laughs> my experiment! <laughs> experiment! It's also funny, like, how did they get away? Their cameras were on them and they casually yeah, walked away. They sauntered off screen. <laughs> also, count how many times Wolverine pops his claws just for <laughs> emphasis. Yeah. Like the, he can't use them. <laughs> it's true. He can only since he can't stab anybody with him, he just has to go like, eh, eh, check that out. Like it, it's even sillier in the Spider-Man and his amazing friends where they introduce Wolverine when this is the 80s where he really can't stab anything. The way they show he has claws is he makes a shish kebab with his claws uh-huh. on he's like oh look at all these pineapples S- stab one claw through it they're mainly for kitchen use <laughs> a little back and forth with spidey because wolverine can't murder people in this show it gets rid of one of the core tensions in spider-man wolverine team-ups which is wolverine kills people all the time spider-man never kills people and he's usually telling wolverine can you stop killing people i don't want you to murder people in front of me I I try to do non-lethal attacks. I just punch someone so hard they fall asleep. But that's one thing I didn't know about as someone who never read the comics. Like, oh, Wolverine kills people with those things. All the time. All the time. Like, especially in the Wolverine solo comics when he's on a solo adventure without the other X-Men to tell him, hey, you really shouldn't kill this guy. He just kills everyone everybody like the guiltiest party of it is thanks to the it was the chris claremont frank miller comic where wolverine goes to japan and he kills i think like 700 ninjas in it. <laughs> and it just looks cool it looks cool to see him slicing up ninjas it is fun it's and, why he's popular and it's why the ninja turtles fight ninjas it's also because of that comic too they oh really okay. frank miller having ninjas fight characters in the early 80s 
that's what Eastman and Laird loved so much. Mm. So yes, we then get to hear more about the evil plans of Landon. He is going to kill everybody. And this is when we get to the, it could work as an allegory for being a different race. It can work as an allegory for being gay. I think in this scene, it actually works better as a gay allegory because one of the characters is literally in the closet about being a mutant in the scene and the other is proudly out and everyone knows he's a mutant. Genevieve. Genevieve. That's a weird name. The assistant to Dr. Landon. She is not in that original Mutant Agenda comic, which you lose so much without her here as a character who learns a lesson. And she has the power to stop falling cages. It's a very important power that she has. Th- does she become an actual like X person or uh... No, she's made up for this and okay. never comes back again. Landon actually does come back in the show after this episode, but Genevieve, no, she never comes back. She's one of those one off characters. But this is a big reason why I picked this episode because I love, again, as a gay allegory, I love hearing Beast talk about how his self-hating past, overcoming it, and now regretting how he felt in the past. Why are you helping this madman? Mr. Landon's not mad. He wants to eliminate the mutant condition, the suffering they must endure. No, he wants to eliminate mutants. If they don't exist, then they can't suffer. Maybe it's the only way. You must have thought so too once. Everything he's done is based on your early work. My early work? Yes. Once I was filled with much self-loathing. I wanted to eliminate my mutancy more than anything. Remembering that I once felt that way has for years been my darkest secret. I was wrong. Being a mutant has brought great joy into my life. No! There's nothing good about being a mutant. Mutants are freaks! Methinks the Lady Dove protests too much <laughs> talking to myself here yeah it's uh, they, it's one of those lines made in editing where they just like slow down his head drop just a little <laughs> bit and we'll put in one more line here <laughs> they're so they, they talk so much in this this is in in batman the animated series you don't often feel like oh for clarity's sake they added a line here or there like that feels pretty rare it seems like most of the stuff is storyboarded to the dialogue and they didn't change up too much yeah on spider-man total opposite every line feels recorded many times maybe the problem was for the price it's not that they flew them out once it's that they flew them out multiple times to re-record dialogue after they got the animation back Perhaps. make him say more <laughs> beast uh, this scene is kind of flat unless beast quotes shakespeare here uh but yeah i mean obviously the thing of him being a mutant and saying like oh i was wrong being a mutant has brought great joy into my life it makes me so sad the genevieve character that she's like she hates being a mutant so much she's like maybe if we just killed them all their suffering would end <laughs> you know maybe it's good for them there's some flaws to that logic <laughs> this is when it's clear beast has figured out already like well actually he says i've suspected it for a long time at the end of the episode this is some heavy stuff for a kid's cartoon i feel like the all the allegorical metaphorical stuff in steven universe and they do great metaphorical episodes about heavy topics i think the executives in charge of it recognize the metaphor more clearly now and they make them have slightly more distance than they would yeah there's an entire there's multiple episodes of steven universe actually that are metaphorically uh teaching kids in the important lesson of consent in uh, you know romantic or sexual situations but they have to put it in a lot of russian dolls yeah. It's, it's heavily nested they're not just swapping out proper nouns like they are in this show <laughs> exactly yeah and also our pals at steven universe they grew up watching this stuff and getting all these metaphors about mutants the x-men comics have historically had some of the most queer fan base ever of the shows hmm. i'm looking forward to x-men 97 because the head writer of that show is an african-american gay man hmm. so i'm i'm really looking forward to see what he can bring to it i too. hope disney does a buckle to pressure because there's lots of bad crowds that are upset with them right now especially a gay show for kids yeah though x-men 97 is not for kids it's for, 40s. It's for 43 year old men <laughs> yes. that's how old we'll be when it's on the air god i was thinking that based on the timeline of mcu planned releases that if they ever make an x-men movie i will be like 48 when that movie comes out like that and that's if i'm lucky <laughs> think of all the movies they'll make when you're dead though uh man that's it's, uh, old, it's a bummer i'm thinking of all the zelda games i won't get to play well, by that point, it'll be AI doing all this. Oh, movies. yeah. So there'll be yeah. infinite Zelda games and Spider-Man movies. <laughs> yeah. So there's just there's no reason to even think. It's just like even when the human race is wiped out, 
they'll still be generating this content. <laughs> it's a switch that can't be turned off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Beast, by the way, is voiced by George Buzza or Buzza, but he, you would know him, Bob, from the Canadian Maniac Mansion show. He was on that show. Oh, who did he play? Uh, he played Turner Edison, which is what, a giant man child? Oh, basically. yeah. That irritating character. <laughs> man. Sounds like the complete opposite of Hank McCoy, the Beast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> man, yeah. Uh, check out my upcoming book about Maniac Mansion by uh, Boss Fight Books. It's actually about the sequel i do spend a few pages on the series but the beast here this also is a big deal for comic nerds that they do not explain correctly for a non-comic nerd but that flashback of him not as a blue guy uh, you may not know this bob but trying to cure himself of being a mutant turns him into the blue monster man like oh that's, i didn't know this yeah so his mutant power already was he's a big guy who's good at jumping around like he's a big agile dude and then trying to cure himself thanks to his own self-loathing of being a mutant makes him more of a mutant. So it was a smart move. He should look more like a beast. I mean, obviously the Beauty and the Beast allegory is so in your face now, but in 1972, it wasn't so hmm. overused. Is, is there a flashback in this episode with him in a more human form? I, didn't, I yeah. guess I didn't know that was him until you told me. In this scene when he's saying, yes, back then I tried to do that. That's him in the flashback. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But you have to be a hardcore. I'm too dumb for this show <laughs> for kids from 30 years ago they go through the hallways they beat up some dudes wolverine has to just toss guys around instead of stabbing them and then spider-man webs them up that's when we also get the cute joke of wolverine saying he can't even spell subtlety uh then we cut to hobgoblin and he goes to the very obvious screen mutant genetic research he's like oh i guess this is where the mutant genetic research is uh, the guy should not have made a screensaver the words mutant genetic research <laughs> and then he downloads everything to a cd-rom disc in like two seconds which you could not do that in 1994 <laughs> yeah jesus you could uh, not but man we get two stunning computer heads that talk to him yes this is uh i also gotta give it uh in this clip here mark hamill's computer voice acting fake computer voice acting it makes me laugh <laughs> mutant genetic research computer open wide tell me all your secrets all data on mutant genetic code has been transferred to cd rom nice treat now for the trick greetings your computer's data has just been deleted by Hobgoblin Computer Finders. Oh, I'm such a bad hacker. Jesus. I had in my notes, hello, Smithers. You're quite good at turning me on. I Why didn't I think of that? You're right. That is, I love how he goes like, computer virus. <laughs> uh, it's like I was thinking Lamar Man, but in this case, I feel like the Star Fox team should fly in and be shooting at his head. <laughs> and, and it's made by the Fear Effect people like, all right, you want a head talking? I, I think, too, they totally stole this beat from uh, 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 uh that yeah. Nedry does in Jurassic Park. I guess they did have time for that. It's it's about it's a little over two years later. So. Yeah, they, they've had time to rip it off. But also, yes, it's Lawnmower Man looked much better than this. On television show budget, the video game developers were told, like, can you have lip sync on a character in this? And <laughs> they're like, uh, no, we can't, but we'll, we'll give it our best shot. And yeah, you know, I was giving too much credit to Hamill earlier. That's just the Joker. Like, that, I, I could have said, and then the Joker steals some information and played it. People would think that was a scene they forgot from the Batman yeah, show. It's like, well, no, he's not the Joker. His laugh is slightly different. He likes tricks, not jokes. <laughs> <laughs> totally Way different. different. Yeah, he's like, bad, 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 bad. That bad, 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 bad. If he was the Joker, he'd be like, bad, 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 bad. He'd just be a little higher A, a little up more, yeah. <laughs> and so, yes, he, he flies off. We then get to see them crawling around looking for stuff. I also have another quick clip here of David Warner getting pissed off at seeing them running around. Nice moves, kid. Well, you're not too bad yourself, for an old guy. Put us down! Hey! Put hey! Us down! Hey! Don't hang around waiting for us. <laughs> that way. The chemicals are at just the right temperature. It's time to begin, Genevieve. Are you sure we're doing the right thing? This is no time for second thoughts. Mutants are a curse on the human race. To be a mutant is to be cursed. 
first. Sir, Spider-Man and Wolverine are headed for your lab. No, you must stop them. Do you hear me? Stop them. <laughs> no. <laughs> Man, he is, he needs medication, this guy. <laughs> I, I mean, too, the way she says to be a mutant is to be cursed. Like, this is a kid who goes to a religious institution that tells them not to be gay. It's also very ham-fisted. I will say my life philosophy <laughs> yes. concisely out loud. <laughs> yeah, when they say don't hang around, that's because, again, they can't even punch these guys, which seems more dangerous. They throw them into the rafters and they're like, well, d hey, don't fall 30 feet, guys. <laughs> yeah. This was the non-lethal way of dealing like, with Well, I you. guess he could have cut us in half, so... <laughs> This is another one for the comic fans here. When he says, nice move, kid, that's because there's always an age differential between Wolverine and Peter Parker. This Peter Parker is basically early 20s, and Wolverine, Wolverine's origins have not been fully revealed at this point in the comics, but he was an adult man in World War II, already established at this point, so he is at very least in his 80s. So that's uh, something to keep in mind for Wolverine. Yes, yeah, that's why when he says for an old guy, that's, that's Spidey making fun of his age. But I assume he can live longer because of healing healing factor makes him age uh like basically at a quarter of the time everybody does like in the very famous uh, comic book flash forward the days of future past wolverine has aged basically 10 years or 20 years and 40 years mm. pretty much they then get caught in a dead end and this is when wolverine pops the claws and uses them in the only way he's allowed to slashing through a wall <laughs> <laughs> i like how spider-man even goes like cool like just to let kids know hey this is cool wolverine's claws they're really cool <laughs> but only for use on walls yeah it's uh, and maybe like crates <laughs> or something i also like how spider-man's like so hey loser you got us caught in a dead end some good job tracking there wolverine but it's not even a dead end there's like two hallways going off to the side i was confused yeah i'm gonna say that it's because logan smells that in the next room over is the beast but he has to cut through the walls because technically it's the fastest if there's no wall there i feel like spider-man could have punched through that wall faster it's than like, he sliced through it why don't we turn around the corner and see if there's a door <laughs> and then well there's a bunch of guys on the other side of that door that's true so yes wolverine as he's slashing away beast has to tell her like he's trying to really rub in the guilt of like well i guess you're gonna murder me but uh, it's not the way i'd have chosen to have leave my mark on the world of science <laughs> just to let her know like you know you really don't have to murder somebody just because <laughs> the guy tells you to <laughs> cut to spider-man and wolverine trying to cut through the door well spider-man just gets flattened by an exploding door too yeah i thought that was going to be an act break when his hand is twitching under the door but he immediately throws it off of himself whatever the fox rules were on ads made for weird act breaks because they have to have the opening and then an act break at three minutes in and they all already have to fit in the previously on uh that's a whole minute too it's a really weird act break structure they have here i kept thinking every time i feel like they had to write the show to have seven act breaks just so they can choose where three will go in it yeah i guess there are more com uh, commercials in this because it has less of a running time too that way we can learn about the how, how tasty corn pops are mm -hmm. or filling out entries into our local contests for probably an x-men video game i'd say <laughs> also very distracting that the voice of spider-man is also the southern guy who's saying like oh, i'm gonna get you now spider-man <laughs> Spider-Man beats up those guys. They then crash through the wall, and that's when we get the X-Men theme once again in the show. <laughs> what is this? A mutant cook-off? I am only a bird in a gilded cage. Then it's time to fly the coop. No, don't! His quip made no sense. <laughs> yes. A mutant cook-off, I mean... I guess because it's like a bubbling vat, but like, what's like is a chili? Is the joke instead of a chili cook off, it's a mutant cook off? Oh, you know, that, that could be the joke. I was thinking more of like a barbecue, but yeah, it's just a chili cook off joke. I also feel like the delivery is weird because the Canadian voice actor, maybe in Canada, they don't have chili cook offs, and the concept to him sounded weird. That's Cal Dodd as Wolverine. I love his screams as Wolverine that I kept in there, like, ah, like he's, hey, he's a good screamer. They've got poutine. <laughs> They have poutine cook-offs instead of chili cook-offs. It's there. better. It's better. And I also, though, he looks like such a dumbass Wolverine. He's like, well, time to get you out. And he's like, no, you fucking idiot. Do you see how these are laser bars yeah. on my cage? He's, he's like a bug flying into a bug zapper. <laughs> he got his plants on it in like a cartoon take. Yeah. yeah. Like like he's Wile E. Coyote hitting the wall. Uh, uh, it is ridiculous how the show goes on with the Beast kind of 
holding Wolverine yeah. as, as every, everybody is dangling. It's like a chain of superheroes eventually. It yeah. seems like it would make more sense with the time compression of the comic, but when it plays out on an animated series, he's being held up for like seven minutes, it feels like. On the comic page, in the original thing, sort of this happens, the Wolverine isn't there. It works so much better over 10 panels than 10 minutes. It moves really slow. It feels like 10 minutes. I think it's more like three minutes, but yeah, then, well, also I think what takes away from it is I kind of like that Spider-Man has to all hold, it's uh, three layers of them holding each other, but it means that in this sequence, the actual active competitor guys fighting each other are Hobgoblin and Landon instead. Yeah, yeah. it really is a Hobgoblin <laughs> Landon show off. <laughs> yeah. Showdown, sorry. It's like, oh, who's going to finally win? Hobgoblin or Landon? Yeah, but Spider-Man does stop them and then he stops it from dropping and then Hobgoblin comes in and throws a bomb and his Spider-Sense doesn't warn him of that. His, his Spider-Sense fell down on the job there but this is when their business keeps getting interrupted it's also funny the way warner says ever heard of comma like again a very silly thing for him to say and of course by the way everybody's got laser guns because this is not batman they have to yeah. it's got to be laser they're the most like uh super scope six looking things in the world yeah even it's it's not so bad when security guys have it in the tv show but when they draw regular plain clothes nypd officers and they all have laser guns that's where it really ends yeah up. a guy in a suit should not be firing this thing <laughs> and then we have a quick completely needless cutaway to the kingpin here this confused me it's like wh why is he here why is he being mean to a guy in a wheelchair <laughs> this uh entirely does not make sense if you are just dropping into the show kingpin is like the overarching seasons long villain of the show like he's this secret mafia boss who is uh, pretends to be a legitimate businessman but because this is a silly cartoon show this mafia boss is interested in having cybernetic warriors or maybe even his own mutant army so basically landon tricked him into funding it so he'd get a mutant army but this kingpin cutaway stuff isn't needed at all they do not need to cut to him and then meanwhile he's got alistair Smythe there who he's his science guy who builds him robots and again you wouldn't know any of this he stole professor x's chair he did and this character well this character is disabled in the comics too so it's not like they stole it for that but don't worry by the end of this season he'll get what he gets in the comics which are cybernetic legs mm. that let him kick spider-man really hard he was one of my favorite toys i loved his design though he's a total ripoff of a xenomorph like mark bagley the character designer just totally stole the xenomorph design oh okay but yes kingpin is not happy <gasps> spider-man Keep us still or Wolverine is lost to us. No problem. But whatever you do, just don't make me laugh. Logan, snap out of it, Logan! Can't move. Need time to... Situation critical, sir. Landon's chasing Hobgoblin. Spider-Man and the mutants are wrecking the lab. <laughs> and what about the mutant army that Landon wants to create for me? I don't think that was ever Landon's intention, sir. <laughs> How disappointing. Evacuate immediately. I no longer have need for a spy on those premises. My men and I are bailing out. Operation terminated. I told you not to trust Landon. Mind yourself, Smythe, or I may take out my frustration on you. Do you understand quite? That's happening at super speed, too. <laughs> yeah, that really confused me. It's always fun to see the Kingpin, though. I like that guy. It's uh, He's played by Vincent D'Onofrio uh, in live action in the MCU. Uh, he was first in the Netflix show, and now he's officially transferred into the cinematic universe as well. I was looking to this voice actor. He sounded familiar. This is one of the few times where a black voice actor plays a white character. Oh, I didn't know this. Yeah, I, uh, I missed that. Roscoe Lee Brown. Wow, okay. That's cool. And like, the Kingpin was made into a black character in some of the Spider-Man content? Yes, because in Dare daredevil he is played by michael clark duncan and then uh, he also michael clark duncan played that role in the talk about bad cgi in the mtv cgi spider-man show mm -hmm. from the early aughts <laughs> he plays the kingpin in that too in his black so occasionally the kingpin is black normally though he he's uh played by white actors yes or or italian actors yeah 
are Italian American. I guess D'Onofrio's Italian American, right? We call them Spaghetti Boys. Oh, yes, <laughs> he's played many a Spaghetti Boy. Is played uh, the Kingpin. So yeah, then Spider Man is holding everybody up. They can't move, and then it's just a big old fight and argument. I, I gotta say, the cop goblin looks like a dope in this. Like he gets his fucking thing stuck in a in the stairwell. Yeah, this is like some classic buffoonery. <laughs> he, he looks yeah, like a dope. It, it, I did laugh at the image of Hobgoblin trying to pry his hoverboard out of a uh, railway. It's like railing, a kid railing. getting its head stuck between the banisters. And he's like, yeah, oh, man. <laughs> it's like he locked his bike to the thing the wrong way. And he's stuck for so long because Landon has to run up like eight flights of stairs to point a gun at him for it. But yeah, they try to negotiate. Then Landon, you know, fails. He flies away. He's about to leave with his life's work. And Landon can't take it. He does the very stupid thing of jumping off of like a, the landing to try to catch Hobgoblin. And this is when he really makes a splash. You scientists always get too immersed in your work. My, my. Right where I've always wanted you. Can you play a little game of catch? You animal! Ah, the chance of profit is gone. Therefore, so am I. Come on, suckers! Be seeing you! <laughs> How about some action down there? I'm getting tired! No problem. It's nice to hear a so long suckers every now and then. Yeah, yeah. It became Homer's catchphrase on The Simpsons. Yeah. But and this is when Wolverine wakes up and they swing the rest of the way off. Like, finally, Wolverine. How convenient. Wolverine wakes up now all of a sudden when Hobgoblin's gone. This is where Genevieve freaks out because she did just see land and land in the goop that, will, uh, that would have killed a mutant. And again, this is another thing from the comic that's not as good. It's supposed to be deadly to fall into the mixture. Spider-Man falls in it, and I think it was a miscommunication with the writer and the artist because the artist just drew him falling in, and then they pull Spider-Man out, and he's like, oh, uh, I think your costume saved it from hitting any of your skin. I'm like, wait, no. <laughs> no, it didn't. I mean, what was the plan for Beast, just to kill him? I guess, yeah, it was just to see, does this kill... I mean, if he wants to kill all mutants, you know, he do different than just dropping him in liquid. That could be yeah. water, then. Yeah, yeah. He <laughs> Drop a cage in water, <laughs> he'll drown. But I guess yeah it's to test if the liquid can destroy a mutant i suppose but as uh, we find out from the beast what does it do to a regular human this is another bit where i was like boy this looks weird uh, i'm sure it looks fine in storyboards and then tms just did what the storyboards told him to do but basically the superheroes just have to stand still for three minutes while <laughs> they watch a monster appear just kind of watch as it crawls away with a woman <laughs> yeah it's so it doesn't make any sense yeah <laughs> this landed monster looks like something the real ghostbusters fought i think it does i think somebody brushed off their real ghostbusters thing the, <laughs> the only times in this episode that felt like oh this is tms trying or doing what they're good at is the monster transformation though obviously it's like it's not two frames a second they animate the transformation but yeah it's good for this show i'll say it does look a little more anime and a little higher quality than the rest of the show it feels like they're trying a bit and then also i like hearing that beast is like how ironic he hated monsters and now he is one. Oh, how intelligent beast <laughs> yeah. it's more like tragic i would say than ironic yeah yeah it's like oh what's that line on mystery science theater and they're like well this is ironic it's not like he said i never wanted to be a spider monster or whatever <laughs> i'd really hate being a spider monster our wonderful heroes watch as a giant monster appears and they stand very still in yeah this next sorry uh, yeah. you're gonna play the clip in a second but i'm watching it it is very funny just to see them not moving yes yeah in these shots they were told the border just said well yeah they stand still for this and say look at that look at that <laughs> Is happening to him. Landon was so anxious to create something toxic to mutants that he failed to determine its effect on normal human cells. Do something! You're mutants! Use your powers! There is nothing we can do. How ironic. He is becoming what he hated most a mutant. Look, he is absorbing energy from that control panel. So what? Mr. Landon! He can help you. It was his work that created all this. Remember? What? Forgive me, Logan. I will explain when this is over. Remind me not to ask. <laughs> it's a very brief, but I like that 
Logan learns that Beast is sort of invented this whole process and then he sees that Beast is guilty about it and then Wolverine forgives him later on. It's very quick. It takes place over an entire act uh, it tops, but uh, it's a nice little extra emotional level to it's, it. It's a lot to forgive a guy for that. <laughs> I guess you did invent Cyclone B, but you know, <laughs> you regret it. You feel bad about you it. Were, uh, you were hurting then. <laughs> you were hurting and I, I mean, Wolverine, he's, he's had his own self-hatred too. So yes, a monster goes through downtown, smashing things up. Wolverine is the first one to actually even try to do anything, and then he just gets smacked away. I do like these changes. You sure showed him. Shut up, you puny little geek. <laughs> <laughs> it is no. nice to hear geek in this context. Also, this is before the Pokemon Shock Syndrome. Though I oh, think yeah. I'm pretty sure this has been darkened on Disney+. Plus. I think if we had the taped off TV version from 95, yeah. this would all be very bright and electric. During here. some of those scenes, I was like, is there a brownout happening? what's what's going on especially when it's like okay so he's being electrocuted and now jubilee hits him with fireworks too <laughs> as they walk away i also like how it's exactly like the melodramatic comics where spider-man has an internal monologue of like ah, oh, this is the thing i'm afraid of turning into as well oh no like though a problem in this is in a comic book you would see like the little box or the thought balloon that lets you know this is an internal thought. So many times Spider-Man on this show talks without lip sync or even a jaw yeah. movement. You might think he's saying this out loud. You know, I assumed he was just saying all of these things. They should have put an effect on the uh, the dialogue, <laughs> a like, like extra echo extra. or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. This was the reason I love Spider-Man as a kid, because I have a constant internal monologue I have to silence, especially as a kid. I was like, oh, Spider-Man's just like me. You know, some people don't have that, and I, I feel like we should track them down. Who are these freaks? You're the freaks. <laughs> You're the freaks out there. You're the mutants. <laughs> so. Some people can't rotate objects in their head either. Isn't that weird? I'm doing it now. Yeah, I can see. I'm looking at a, an old Spider-Man toy I loved and turning him around and seeing a wonderful I, I'm Spider rotating a cow. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I can... Okay, that's the back of a picture frame. Yeah, I see it right there. <laughs> but really feel bad for TMS on the budget they have. That they're like, now it's time for a King Kong sequence. Yeah. He's, he, he's going to go through the middle of Times Square with a, holding a woman and climbing up a building. Like, it's an entirely a King Kong sequence. But thankfully, all the shots on him are very tight, so you don't notice there's nobody in the street at all. And there's no sense of scale either, too. Yeah. yeah. And meanwhile, Spider-Man and Wolverine and Beast all just kind of stay in bed like, boy, that's bad, huh? He's got a lot of electricity. But fortunately then... The X-Men appear, and all the rest of the X-Men get their paycheck for this episode, even though Jean Grey is silent in this uh, one. She's in the first episode, but Jean Grey doesn't get a line in this hmm. one. Well, they, don't, they have, like, no time in this episode when they show up. And also, Jean Grey has a redundant power with the secret power that uh, Genevieve has. Jean Grey is also a telepath uh, who can shoot concentric circles out of her brain that lifts things up. Isn't that funny that that's how they're like, well, how do we represent telepathy? Uh concentric circles shooting out of the brain well spider yeah. sense is basically stink lines i love the oh the spidey stink stinky lines. head <laughs> yes i mean i think the circles thing i feel like the first guy to do it was aquaman talking to fish mm. when i see it i think of aquaman talking to fish on su on super friends but yes the x-men are here gotcha <laughs> i'll bet you say that to all the guys we came as soon as we heard the news. What can we do? Landon was using physioelectrical energy to stimulate the mutant cells to self-destruct. Now he needs it to hold his own cells together. Yes, that would explain Landon's craving for electricity. He is a walking storage battery. <laughs> well, what if we shut off his power? It would slow his growth, but not stop it. However, if we short-circuited the physioelectrical energy field... Right. I'll just climb up there, hand him a wire, and say, hold this. Wait, we could do it remotely. If we had a microwave antenna uh, adjusted to the right frequency and a transmitter big enough to hold all that energy, yes, that would work. We have both in the Blackbird. <laughs> Come with me. So, there appears to be a keen scientific mind behind that garish mass, eh, my friend? Takes one to know one, blue boy. We just happen to have all of these things. <laughs> it's pretty convenient. I mean, we brought our monster destroying equipment. <laughs> 
I also I like when Spidey and Beast can be friends. It's like, hey, we're both science nerds. That's fun. But Spider Man, it makes me feel bad the way Spider Man goes. Like, uh, it takes one to know one, Blue Boy, and the way Beast like they pull the wrong shot to recycle of Beast mm-hmm. just putting his head down. Like, ooh, that really hurt my feelings. <laughs> I feel bad for Beast there. I also like that Cyclops is completely useless. He's supposed to be the team leader. He's like, what do we do? What do we do? I guess I'll just keep flying this plane. <laughs> Gambit gets to throw a car. Hard. Jubilee gets to shoot stuff. Rogue gets to fly around. Cyclops pilots the plane. This is why everybody thinks Cyclops is boring. He just sits in the in the cockpit the whole time. I, I remember thinking Gambit was very cool as a kid, but he just throws shit, right? Yeah, he throws exploding cards okay. pretty much. Well, he can charge non-organic materials with kinetic energy, hmm. and then they explode like a bomb, but they are not like, they don't create like fire. It's just like basically the impact of a bomb without any of the thing that's that makes a bomb explode pretty much. And because he's a cool edgelord, he is perfect at throwing cards. Like, he's just like, ooh, I throw the cards, mode at me. But nobody cares about him now, right? <laughs> yeah, people who grew up with the X-Men cartoon do like him and Rogue together, but no, he, not really. Nah. Gambit is also so over-designed. Oh, yeah, he is, like, out of the Image Comics era. Yeah, again, the animators, like you said, they have to get every detail. Like, no, gotta be his trench coat, and then his weird collar thing, and then his uh, heavily accented boots, and then a purple chest in the middle oh and also he's got a collapsible staff as well and he throws pink cards yeah i'm looking at his design in the series and he has more lines in him than like an entire scene of batman like (laughs) an entire still frame with multiple characters well i mean too if you're on the tms team who has to do spider-man instead of batman spider-man is lines the character oh absolutely (laughs) yeah oh my god there is occasionally spider-man like will point at somebody i'm like oh his armband moved into the wrong spot but i don't blame them i i uh (laughs) also i think rogue is written as too horny for spider-man i don't Mm. like it she's like but you say that to all the gals her her personality is horny though which is why i liked her as a little boy i mean she's a sexy southern belle with giant big porn star hair of the time yes (laughs) well all right she's a music video girl hair. she's a total tease because you can't touch her oh yeah oh man that's the per i mean that's a great one to have a crush on when you're like you're attracted to girls but also scared of them Mm -hmm. yeah well and it doesn't hurt too that she wears basically like skin tight clothing painted on clothes absolutely yeah uh though maybe that's that's why she's into spidey spidey is the same he also wears painted on skin tight clothes too though with no noticeable bulge like he's tucking Part of the skill of being a, a hireable Spider-Man artist is even though he is constantly jumping with legs splayed, you have to be like, no noticeable budge, bulge. Don't make people think about Spider-Man's dick, even though his <laughs> legs are spread wide open. There are other comics for that. And also, speaking of which, like I love Beast just walking around in his underwear all the time. <laughs> he's, he's a barefoot superstar. They decide to make their silly little plan, uh, and then... I like how Storm even says, power of lightning illuminates the night. She's like freaking Dr. Orpheus with all her pronouncements. She's trying to outdo uh, David Warner in this with being theatrical. She probably has to pick it up a little bit. She's in the same room as David Warner. Like, oh man, I got to really bring it. And yeah, I mean, I loved all her pronouncements in the X-Men cartoon. And yeah, Jubilee hits the fireworks, causing a bunch of seizures. Gambit then catches the girl. And then it's kind of cute. He does a little okay sign to the camera. Like, hey, I got the girl, Mona me. <laughs> They then wrap him up, microwave him. He's starting to shrink down, but it's pulling down the ship. They're going to die. And then very conveniently, they get saved in the air by Genevieve. Though at the very least, they did set it up in the first episode. They're like, who stopped the uh, the roof from falling? And now the mystery is revealed. It's mm. her. She has the incredible telepathic ability to telepathically catch a airplane. She should not. I, I'm just saying there's so many worse off mutants than her. She is a white blonde lady who is attractive and she can just not use telepathy and she still hates being a mutant like there's there's mutants like leech who are little green men who never look normal she she passes as human she can pass and yeah i guess is this me mad about passing people in the queer community or something maybe but uh, (laughs) that's an internal bigotry on my part she can hate herself it's fine but yeah they get caught and we find out why everything's fine oh also landon basically turns into two-face after shrinking back down because they definitely planned on bringing him back and they did and he always has a half monster green guy face returns in season three for a few episodes and still voiced by david warner Hmm. 
But and, uh, does he put on like a monster voice or is he still David Warner? Just David Warner, okay. not, not even a monster voice. Yeah. This is when the secret mutant is revealed. Thank you for saving us and for accepting what you are. You know? Know what? She is a mutant, a telekinetic. I've suspected as much for a long time. A mutant? Of course. It all makes sense now. <laughs> You were the one who rescued me in the auditorium when the ceiling caved in. It's true. I am a mutant. That's why I first went to work for Landon. I had hoped he really did have a cure. I can relate to that. His problem has been solved. But what about the monster within me? You are possessed by no monster. Only your own fear and confusion. We will introduce you to Professor Xavier. He can help you. Maybe somewhere, there's someone who can help me, too. It's Morbius. <laughs> He's going to suck that plasma right out of you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> no, so but you can see how me, mm-hmm. you know, growing up and, and realizing I'm gay and seeing scenes like this where Beast says, like, there's no monster within you. Like, accept yourself like this. This speech about self-acceptance, you can see why I love the Beast so much or as a kid really got into him as a character. Yeah, he's a compassionate person and uh, a lot of superheroes are jerks. He's a big scary guy on the outside, which makes him a big sweetheart on the inside. He's he's basically the smart version of the thing, another of my favorite characters who he's the big rough guy, but on the inside he's actually incredibly sensitive and it's easy to hurt his he's, feelings. He's soft thing. He's uh, he's well, what if you replaced a uh, thing's rocky exterior with a bunch of blue hair, which gets everywhere. I'm I just dog sat recently. I forgot what happens when you have a oh. I, and it was great. He was super sweet. But he was a big white dog and I wore black and uh, like black shorts that day or uh, and instantly covered in hair. Yeah. Like, all right. This is what a dog is. Yeah. They're hair machines. And the beast would be like that if he was your romantic partner. Especially as summertime rolls around. They lose yeah, that winter coat. That's right. Uh, that's probably why I was getting it extra. Also, it's funny. We've heard that in like made fun of in Futurama, but that was just straight ahead of Spider-Man's like, it all makes sense now. I remember before as he's explaining a plot device (laughs) to the characters. But I do like, too, that her self-acceptance is also Spider-Man's. He's like, hey, I can relate. I tried to cure myself, too. And that makes it even funnier in the first episode if you take it as a gay allegory in the in the part one of this, where Spider-Man basically goes to the X-Men's mansion and be like, hey, it's gross to be a mutant and I don't want to be one. Can you guys fucking cure me or what? <laughs> and they're like, uh, no, we kind of like being mutants. Why, why are you coming to us <laughs> looking for a cure? <laughs> He's like, well, no, being a mutant's gross as shit. I don't want to be one. You all make me sick. <laughs> uh, I'd be like you. Ugh, I'd kill myself. Uh, so then we get a little X Men goodbye, which is just it feels like partially an ad for the show of like the X-Men saying if I could hang around and keep watching the adventures of Spider-Man I'd love to we're the X-Men and we think you're great it's important that all the characters like each other because it, it supports both brands <laughs> and I like everybody even says they like Spider-Man in in ways that make sense for their characters in this little clip here I'm sorry we got off to such a rocky start you're a heck of a team player you got that right a regular ace nice working with you kid real nice Thanks. I don't know what to say. Just remember, no matter what problems you got or mistakes you've made, you don't have to carry the load by yourself. You got friends if you need them. Right, Hank? You are correct, Logan. And thank you. It's cute, but it also feels like a PSA where they just help Spider-Man kick the habit. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. You don't have to turn to drugs, kid. <laughs> so that's more McGruff than Wolverine. I mean, their voices aren't dissimilar. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, Toronto McGruff. Is that Toronto McGruff. <laughs> I like, too, that Gambit's like, a regular ace. Eh? That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess Jubilee. I, I ran out of puns, mon ami. <laughs> it's either gumbo or cards. Is what yeah. It. I guess Jubilee has a crush on Spidey, too. She's like, real nice. Like, she's. Like, these ladies are throwing themselves at spider-man yeah hey look spidey's attractive i get it mm-hmm. i get it and yeah so this is when spider-man then also in what i would call bad writing a newspaper smacks him in the face and oh. tells him what the next plot point yeah the is. plot point just whaps him over the head <laughs> i mean this episode actually the plotting reminded me of how things are now in the streaming age where the episode is at a fine ending of spider-man and the x-men are friends and the x-men go back to where they live and spider-man continues his adventures but on a Netflix show, 
Every episode can't end neatly. It has to end with the tease of what the next episode is. And that's this thing they did in 1995 of like, oh, actually, I'm going to have to go to visit Maria Crawford and set up the next episode where she tries to cure me, which she's like friends with Morbius and all that stuff. But yeah, Maria Crawford, only for the hardcores out there know that she is the Haitian supervillain Calypso. Oh, I didn't know this. She never even turns into this in the show. Like she's just basically she's like, Craven's friend, former lover, but in the comics, she's created as Calypso, who is an entirely voodoo stereotype and is not a, uh, a, she's not introduced as a scientist. She's just a sexy voodoo lady drawn by Todd McFarlane. So, oh. yeah, she looks right at home in the Todd McFarlane style. I mean, I like Calypso just fine as a character, but also because she's written by Todd McFarlane, there is nothing to her. Like, Todd oh. McFarlane is a bad writer. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at a picture of her drawn by McFarlane, and her hair is basically like Spawn's cape. Yes, exactly. You wouldn't be surprised to know that he draws Spawn like two years after this, <laughs> the creation of Calypso. But soon, everybody's going to know Maria Crawford because she's one of the major characters in the upcoming Craven the Hunter film. I said it on Twitter. I'm Craven, a better movie. <laughs> After Morbius, they're really doing it with this Craven thing. They're like, no, we're going to have all the supervillains get their own movie. It worked for Venom. It's surely it'll work for Craven. Uh, it's like people actually care about Morbius more than Craven. They're really counting on this Aaron Taylor dude to be that people want to see him, you know, be a sexy large man who <laughs> who hunts animals. If you've watched the trailer, by the way, it's not in the comics that Craven gets his powers from a lion bleeding into his open wound. Oh, so, so don't try that. Don't try that. No, it's somebody pointed out this seems to be what they're doing in the Sony villain verse of things that all of them get their powers through blood. Like Venom got his Venom juice from like a blood transference thing in the in the Tom Hardy Venom. Morbius is all about blood like yeah and and now here craven gets it for blood too mm. like odd all this obsession with blood i it's what i like in the mcu universe none of this obsession with spider-man's radioactive blood though then again this whole season of the neogenic nightmare it's also i feel like every other episode they are looking at spider-man's blood through a microscope like, i only think of the blood when i hear the opening song <laughs> and then it's out of my mind <laughs> but this whole scene you watch more of it you're gonna learn a lot about oh but they can't say blood plasma right right yeah. which is it's in your blood it's yeah <laughs> but don't worry folks if you're worried that spider-man turns into a mutant man spider by the end of the season it's all fixed because the vulture uses his vulture youth stealing tech to suck accidentally suck the mutagen out of spider-man and he turns into the spider the man spider guy so okay, makes sense it all turns out well for spidey but <laughs> but that's in the future then they have uh we have the credits very cheaply done with the concept art behind it they didn't even draw new things They're like this is from the presentation we did to sell this to, <laughs> to fox kid it's like the spider-man desktop wallpaper basically but you know what this episode did its job because one it made me want to watch more of the x-men cartoon and two it made me want to buy spider-man and x-men toys so in that regard it did a good job mm -hmm. but for real it was fun returning to this watching it again i always think like boy this looked worse than i remember like this if you were watching this for animation it looks even worse you should not watch it while watching anything warner brothers did in the 90s yeah but uh every now and then through a line of dialogue or through characterization i am reminded of why i loved these characters and usually my love of the characters can overcome low budget hacked up digital animation from 1995 yeah i stayed far away from this uh, when it was on but now coming back to it i can see the charm and it's fun to revisit every now and then and i can see them making the most of what little they were given in terms of money and time given those constraints it is a good show i think with the upcoming disney plus spider-man and x-men shows seemingly coming out i'm curious can they top this quality of animation or not we shall see maybe <laughs> and maybe by the time this episode comes out san diego comic-con will have happened and maybe they'll have premiered some things or maybe nothing gets shown at san diego comic-con this year because everybody's on strike yeah. i don't know right now it's june 28th folks surprise us <laughs> Though also, I guess the on the animation thing, the Animation Guild is not on strike because they're not WGA, so maybe they will be at Comic-Con promoting stuff. I don't know. All those shows should be WGA. Yeah, yeah. We just saw our pal, a uh, previous Simpsons, uh, talking Simpsons guest, Lindsay K. Tai, who is talking about how her as a executive producer co-showrunner on a cartoon 
she makes less than a starting staff writer on a WGA show, and that should be illegal. Mm -hmm. Check out Mike Scully's tweets about the issue. Uh, he's, he's got some great tweets about it. He's one of the good ones because he got the big Simpsons money. He's been WGA, and he, instead of saying, well, no, I'm a WGA guy. I don't care about animation writers. He actually gives a real shit about animation writers and what they're going through. Like Mike, yeah. Mike Scully is a real working class warrior compared to a lot of the Harvard <laughs> guys he worked along. Side. And he does scold uh, his peers of his generation by saying, you know, you got your big breaks in the 90s and they're not being made available to anyone else and you need to help these people. And I saw him even guilt the Rick and Morty executive producers oh. over the, them not being uh, guilt either. That yeah. was great to see. Yeah, no, Mike Scully's a good one. But anyway, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, end this, we end this podcast by saying, Mike Scully, what a treasure. <laughs> So thank you for listening to What a Cartoon. If you want to support the show and get these episodes one week ahead of time and ad-free, please go to patreon.com slash talking simpsons and sign up at the five dollar level. And once you do sign up, you'll get the advanced episodes, of course, and also access to everything behind that five dollar paywall. That includes monthly new episodes of Talking Futurama and Talking of the Hill, as well as the entire archive of those shows. And you also get uh, past mini series like Batman the Animated Series and Talking Mission Hill and Talking Critic. All told, there were over 150 miniseries episodes that are full length that you haven't heard if you're not a patron of patreon.com slash talking simpsons and there is a ten dollar level as well when you sign up for that level you get access to all of the five dollar stuff naturally but then you can also access one mega long podcast once a month only for patrons of that level or higher and what is that henry Bob's talking about the What a Cartoon movie podcast, which you get to hear a preview of every month if you're listening to this on the free feed. And that means us talking about an animated feature film, often for over six hours. Right now, we're reaching the tail end of our summer of Pixar, as we're going to be talking about at the end of this month, Cars, the 2006 important but not our favorite Pixar movie. But we're going to have a ton of fun talking about that. And the previous month, we covered A Bug's Life. And if you liked all this superhero talk, you're going to love hearing our one about The Incredibles, as well as earlier in the year, us covering Superman, Batman, World's Finest. And obviously, if you love the Spider-Man stuff, you're going to want to go back in the archives and hear us talk about Into the Spider-Verse. There's now almost five years of What a Cartoon movies at your fingertips, often over five hours long. On average, I'd say you are missing out on so much great stuff. In addition to the $5 things Bob just mentioned, if you go up that $10 level, please check it out all for yourself at patreon.com slash talking simpsons and i've been one of your hosts bob mackey you can find me on twitter as bob servo and my other podcast is retronauts it's a classic gaming podcast all about old video games you can find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts and sign up there for two full-length bonus episodes every month and henry how about you Follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. I'm always tweeting up a storm, including about comic books like Spider-Man and the X-Men. And if you're following both of us on Twitter, and if you want to stay up to date with what's going on in the Talking Simpsons network of podcasts, follow at Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter. At Talk Simpsons Pod keeps you up to date when new episodes of Talking Simpsons What a Cartoon and all of our side stuff comes out. Or if we're doing live shows, say at PAX, you can stay up to date in all of those things if you follow at Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter. Twitter or at Talk Simpsons Pod on Instagram. And for an easy to follow list of all of our previously released free podcasts, head on over to TalkingSimpsonsPodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, folks. We'll see you again next time for our extended preview of our What a Cartoon Movie episode all about cars. And we'll see you then. Hey, Bub, this is Wolverine. Be here later today because the walls are going to come a tumbling down when the juggernaut returns to Fox. Yeah, Juggy's back and mad enough to bust this town in half. Looks like we're going to have to teach Round Boy a little manners, X-Men style. So don't miss when we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the juggernaut himself on an all-new X-Men later today right after The Tick, who's next on Fox Kids. Nice tracking, Wolvie. Only problem is, there's no exit. Then I'll just have to make one. Cool.